Thank you very much, Dan. So today my talk is broken up into two portions. First, I'm going to start talking about Oak Ridge National Lab, talk about the manufacturing demonstration facility, kind of show you some of the equipment we have, some of the things we've done in the past, and where we're looking to go in the future. Then I'm going to switch gears. We'll start talking about the hybrid manufacturing and specifically the hot wire deposition development. So Oak Ridge National Lab, we're a leading science and engineering laboratory. We're actually the largest of all of the national labs. Our um, FY18 expenditures was $1.6 billion. We have just under 5,000 employees. Um, we have the world's most powerful neutron source, so we can start looking at residual stresses and parts. Um, we have the world's largest supercomputer. We do a lot with nuclear uh, research. It all started back with the Manhattan Project and the graphite reactor. And then we are also a materials lab. We do a lot of materials research. Now, my facility that I specifically work in, as Dan mentioned, is the Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. And it's an interesting facility. It's actually outside of main campus. So when you go to main campus, there's lots of paperwork. It takes two or three weeks just to get a US citizen inside of the fence. But with the MDF, you can call any one of us up. We can get you in in a matter of minutes. Um, we're a core R&D research facility. And we do a lot of industry collaborations, such as we have a very good collaboration with Mazak that I'm going to talk about today. We do a lot with education and training. We have about 150 interns a summer. We actually have more interns than we have full-time staff members, which is sometimes kind of crazy. Um, and then we do a lot of demonstrations. We like to call them moonshots. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done at IMTS in the past couple of years um, to kind of show how we're pushing the envelope, per se. Um, so the NDF model, um, as we like to talk about, we're innovating technology faster than the competition we copy. So I talked about we love bringing people in, we love showing off our equipment, and we love talking about what we do. Uh, we're much different than a lot of national labs. We don't keep a lot of secrets. Everything that I do, I'm an open book to Mazak. Everything that I learn directly has a direct line back to Mazak and eventually goes out and advances the U.S. manufacturing base. Um, so the MDF were the first national user facility focused on cost share early stage R&D. Right? So that means we collaborate with industry a lot and we're a cost shared facility. So that means we're a one to one cost share. Every dollar that Mazak puts into our facility and they don't pay us. That's equipment, materials, personnel time. A one-to-one -one cost share means the Department of Energy matches every dollar, okay? And we have about 75 of these collaborations going on at one time. So, and um, they're relatively short. We start out with three months. We started with Mazak. Our initial collaboration was three months. Then it goes to two years, and then it keeps growing and growing. Um, so our mission is driven to, we want to reinvigorate the U.S. manufacturing base. We embrace a lot of technical and scientific risk. We're going to be talking about a lot of risky things we've done in the past five months. Um, we're technically diverse. We have a lot of engineers and scientists from a lot of different backgrounds. Um, and we do a lot of co-locations. Not only do we have a lot of national scientists, we have a lot of people from academia, such as Tom Kerfus. He spoke yesterday. He spent time at the White House. Um, we have people who are both at academia and at the MBF, uh, we have people from Mazak that work at the MBF. Um, Robin Cave, he spent, I would say, five or six months now. He spent 40 hours a week working at the MBF. We have, I believe it's 50 personnel from industry who work 40 hours a week at the MBF. We don't pay them. They're paid by their respective companies, but they're located in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and so we love having those collaborations and those co-locations. And of course, we get a lot of students. Uh, right now, the numbers, we have 82 staff members. Um, interns, like I said, these numbers are a little low. I think we have about 150 a summer. So anywhere, it fluctuates anywhere from about 150 to 250 people at the time. Um, in our facility, we encompass all of manufacturing. So we do a lot with additive manufacturing. When it started in about 2008, 2009, it started with our polymer, our bands, our big area additive manufacturing. Um, we also have a carbon fiber composite facility. And the interesting part about that, it's a full-scale carbon fiber production facility. We make 100 tons of carbon fiber a year at a national lab. And so when we do research on it, we do research at scale. We do a lot with intelligent machine tools. We do real-world -to -real processing. 
and we do a lot with robotics and automation. And recently, we've had a very big push in that artificial intelligence, data analytics, manufacturing, cybersecurity. We have the um, nation's leading cybersecurity team. Um, and so that kind of ties everything together. What we're learning on the Mazak and what we're learning on other systems, it all ties together. We're working, and all of this is under one roof. It's not at different user facilities. This is all <coughs> one, one building. Um, so the manufacturing facility, we have about 45 systems. I think we're up to about 50 or 60 right now. So we have over $20 million of equipment from industry. And we don't own hardly any of We don't want to. Our equipment, it rolls over about once every year, once every year and a half. Um, because, like I talked about, we want to innovate faster than people can copy. So if you come down to the MDF, you're going to see our amazing Maytai hot wire system. If you come back in a year, I guarantee it will be different. If I have the same system there, that means I'm not doing my job correctly. Um, and not only do we work with main, the equipment manufacturers, we work with end users that I'll talk about, such as USA Spares. We work with material suppliers, such as Lincoln Electric. So when we research and do a demonstration project, we don't just look at one part. We look at the entire process. So, some of the interesting things we've done, and typically when I when I met a lot of people on the floor, I say Oak Ridge National Lab, and they think about nuclear research, and then I talk about the Shelby Cobra, and they go, oh yeah, you're those guys. And that's who we are. So I believe it was ITS 2016. We produced the 1967 Shelby Cobra. Um, and we actually printed this at the show. So we came into the show, we were starting, we did our designs, we were printing the car out, and at the end, we rolled off. Um, this car. Now, everything about it is some sort of a research project except for the paint job. We sent that out to an actual body shop to do the paint job. Even down, it's got an electric motor inside of it, lots of 3D printed parts, and the main frame is carbon fiber, and we did it start to finish in six weeks. Okay. Now, for your companies that go to IMTS, think about how long you plan for IMTS. We started six weeks before the show. So we started, that's with our, our SolidWorks drawing. Um, we, we tested it once, it didn't quite work right, we tweaked a few things, and so we did start to finish in six weeks. Um, up until a few weeks ago, we had the world's largest 3D printed part. It's a Boeing 777X trim tool. It's 1,300 pounds of carbon fiber ABS. It's shown here, and it took 30 hours to print. Um, Boeing, this is a multi-million dollar tool. It actually, it held the Guinness World Record. It actually cost more money to get it certified than it is for us to actually make it. And the cool part about it, it's a thermal set, so when we get done with it, when Boeing, they actually use this tool, when they get done with it, instead of putting it in a warehouse, you can chop it up, repelletize it, and make another trip tool. You make tools, so instead of having these large warehouses, you have a large database. And when you need the trim tool, any type of mold stamping die, you just make a new one. Um, another thing we've done, is with lightweight hydraulics. So we had a project with O&R um, where they needed robotic arms to go in the front of one of their submersible submarines. The interesting part about this project is it's mutually buoyant. So we have a submarine, every ounce and every um, force of buoyancy matters. And so we made a robotic arm that weighs 25 pounds but it's mutually buoyant. Um, and then we're also working with concrete molds. So we do a lot of 3D printing and polymers. We actually, um, the building, the Domino Sugar Building in New York, they're rebuilding it. It's 42 stories tall, and all of the window molds are made um, and 3D printed. We did the first two stories, then the technology went out to a company, it went out to industry, the US manufacturing base, and then they made the entire building using our window molds. Now, these window molds, they're a lot cheaper than standard molds, and they don't last as long, but the nice part about it is they're cheap to make, and they're quick. So, so you drop one, it breaks in situ, you just print a new one, you can have it in two or three hours. So that kind of gives you an overview of our facility. That's what we've done, that's what we can do. So that kind of sets the stage of where we're going. And now I'm going to change gears, we're going to start talking about hybrid manufacturing. So hybrid manufacturing, um, it actually started in 1994 or 1995 by a gentleman at Missouri S&T named Frank Little. Um, I actually met Frank this past summer at a conference, and I asked him how he came up with the idea of hybrid manufacturing. And he was absolutely hilarious. He talked about, he submitted a grant to the National Science Foundation, asking, he wanted to get in a 3D printer. 
And uh, the National Science Foundation gave him about a quarter of the money he asked for. So he had just enough money to buy some powder, a laser, and he had no motion system. But what he had is a CNC system. So he strapped his laser to a CNC and hybrid was born. Um, so when I talk about hybrid manufacturing, I'm talking about the combination of additive and subtractive. Now hybrid manufacturing, it is a very general term. There's lots of different types. It's not CNC machining, you can have uh, shop painting, you can have micro rolling, so on and so forth. And with hybrid manufacturing, you have increased productivity, so you make internet shaped parts, but you also have the subtractive side, so you can get those good geometrical tolerances and dimensions. So, there's a lot of hype around additive manufacturing. You go to industry, everyone's trying to get into 3D printing. But 3D printing is not enough. Because I can show you parts all day long. Um, so for example, we made this propulsor, Caterpillar Marine Propeller. We printed it. It took a couple of days out of 410 stainless steel. It looks great, right? We walk around, we say, yeah, we printed a propeller. But we didn't. It's not actually a propeller until it has functional surfaces, right? So we have a machine, we can print lots of great stuff, but until you machine it, until you get, you meet all of the requirements, it's not a functional part. Um, we've got a few robotic cells from GKN, so they're robotic arms, six degrees of freedom, that print titanium. They've been, they've been doing research for numerous years now, right? They make some beautiful titanium parts, but once again, they're not functional aerospace components until you can machine them. And then here's a nice picture of our Shelby Cobra hood, right? We have our BAM system, we can make some really nice parts. That's straight off the BAM. But once again, it wasn't a Shelby Cobra until we machined it, right? So machining's been at the MDF forever. So, uh, looking at CNC machining, it's very repeatable, precise, good surface finish, high productivity, we all know that, that's why we're here. But it's very wasteful. There's billions of dollars wasted in ships every single year, and there's a lot of geometric core restrictions, right? No one likes having tools with a six inch holder that, and a tool that sticks out three inches long. That's a big cantilever beam. So when you look at additive manufacturing, you don't have wasted material. You have geometrical freedom. You can make really complex parts. Um, and now that opens up the door to material options, right? So you're not stuck with uh, a build of material that's one type of grain structure, one type of material. You can start blending powders, blending metals together. You can now take two different types of metals that typically don't go together. You can't weld them together, and you start adding transition metals, so you can start uh, combining them together. Um, but additive manufacturing, it has a very long cycle time, and you have very poor surface finish. But when you look at hybrid manufacturing, you get the advantages of both processes without their respective disadvantages. So, three major applications that we see in hybrid manufacturing. If you look just at additive, we love talking about it's tooling, tooling, tooling. But with hybrid, um, the three main things we're seeing is with coating and finishing. So, you can start reducing the cost of certain tools, right? I like talking about hot stamping dies. Toyota, TMI in Indiana, they have a Mazak BC500 powder machine. So what they're doing is they're adding a hard coating to the outside of their stamping dies um, to improve the wear resistance of them, right? So look further down the road. If we can fix these dies, make them better, why not start from the beginning? When you make the die, make it out of a cheaper, softer material, something easy to machine, and then go in with your hybrid machine, add a coating of something really, really hard, machine it down, you're only taking a finishing cut now, and you can reduce those costs. Um, also, moving into repair. These machines are great for repairing parts. We have a project with Delta Airlines I'm going to talk about where we can put a blade in, we can machine it, add to it, machine again without human input at all. So we take out all of that variability in the process. And then finally, just the sheer amount of cost reduction we can have in the process. So this is actually an image pulled from the very first Mazak literature that was released on hybrid maintenance. Um, so this part is a traditional part, minus the Mazak logos printed on it. And this is traditionally made out of Inconel 718. And traditionally this part costs $90,000 to produce, right? So you don't want to mess many of those up. So with hybrid manufacturing, what they did is they took a look at their specification in the drawing. And they changed it. They said, well, 
only these features really need to be made out of ink. Everything else, let's do something cheaper. Let's look at 316 stainless steel. So they changed their substrate. They only added everything you've seen, kind of this yellowish orange, the Inconel 718, and they reduced the production cost by 97%. Okay? You don't have to make many of these parts before you start paying for equipment. So at the MDF, um, right now we have three hybrid machines. The first one is the Mazak PC500, the hot wire deposition that we're going to talk about. This is serial number one. Um, if I'm correct, it went to IMTS, came back here, then it went down to our facility. When it showed up in the door, I think it maybe ran for an hour at a time. There wasn't very many hours. Um, it was a great system to work on. Uh, then we have this Haas system, and I, I thought long and hard about putting a picture of a Haas system up here. But what I want to talk about is what's inside of it, right? So this is a retrofit system. With hybrid, you always talk about retrofits. And this has one of the hybrid manufacturing technologies and it has. Okay, so this is Jason Jones out of Texas. Uh, it's the same blown powder nozzle that's on the BC500 AM that's out on the floor, okay? Now we just took a standard machining center, you put a laser on it, a mist collector to pull out the dust, and then the additive head in it. It goes right in the cap 40 spindle. And we can take a standard machine and turn it into a hybrid machine. Right? If you don't need a brand new machine platform, you can take machines that already exist and retrofit them. Uh, but they have their associated disadvantages that I will get into. And then finally, uh, one of my favorites is the Medusa system. So we're starting to look at bigger parts. Um, this is a three robot. It's a Lincoln Electric system. Wolf, they own Wolf Robotics there. Wolf Robotic Systems, three robots, rotary tables. So that's 19 degrees of freedom if you're counting. It's, it's a controls nightmare. The build volume, we're going to make parts that are two meters in diameter and two meters tall, roughly. Um, the deposition on this can go up to 100 pounds of steel an hour. Um, honestly, it's going to probably run about 30 to 40 pounds an hour. But if we wanted to push it 100 pounds an hour, we can make very large parts with it. So right now this is strictly an additive system, but come by the MTF in probably eight months, this is going to have a five-axis CNC wrapped around it. We're going to turn it into a hybrid system. So, and these aren't going to work independently, they're going to work simultaneously. We're going to have three robotic arms working on the same part at the same time that we're removing material. So we're very happy about it. So, um, moving in more specifically to the Mazak hot, Mazak hot wire system, it was installed at the MDF May 6, 2019. So everything that I'm going to talk about is only five months worth of work. Okay? Um, if you haven't seen it yet, this is the picture of the inside. So you can see your spindle there. It's the additive head extends down. It's offset about four to six inches. And this is what the process looks like. Okay? Now, Hot wire. It has a laser that goes down, that's what melts the substrate, creates your dilution. The hot wire part is it adds a resistance to the wire and it preheats the wire, makes it uh, more malleable, easier to extrude, and uh, it's less work for the laser. Okay, that's the difference with the hot wire. Now we don't always use the hot wire, we can turn it on and off. We we'll work with cord wire, you don't want to use hot wire because you start marking on the inside of the wire. So Three main research areas that we're interested in at the MPS is process development. When we have serial number one, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to use the darn thing. Okay. After that, we're interested in slicing strategies, so we have to figure out how to program. Hybrid manufacturing has been in the industry space since 2016, 2017. Um, the CAN companies released software about the same time. They were developed kind of in parallel. Right? So not only do we work with the equipment suppliers, we work with the, the CAM providers as well. And then we're going to talk about situ monitoring control. And this kind of is the forward looking, uh, what we're doing day to day. So process development. Just looking strictly at the additive process, there are nine different knobs you have to have settings for before you can even run the machine. Okay? This is not even thinking about machine. Um, so things like surface speed, focal distance, or the distance between the laser and the substrate. You have laser output nozzle, sh shield and gas flow, wire feed speed, hot wire power, uh, step over and layer height. Right? There was a lot of things we had to develop. Now, when we got the machine run off, 
Um, this wasn't the first part we made, but it was one of the first, right? So I worked with the guys that installed the machine, we turned it on, and we made a simple wall. And it looked kind of like that. Now, that's actually not that bad. Even though it's got some excess wire, it's got some bumps on it, but we have a five axis CNC, so I can go in there with an inbuilt. I can cut off the top, make it level, I can contour the outside, I can make this look like a beautiful part. You would never know it. But it's wasteful and it's inefficient. So what we did is we did a series of experiments. We just looked at all these parameters, we found a constant variable, which is um, uh, power, uh, linear power. What it is, is we look at the amount of energy that's inputted into the weld pool at any certain time. That means if I turn a single knob, I have a constant variable that I can look at. So what we do is we try to find that maximum, that sweet spot for that numerical value. And then what we do is we optimize the system. We maximize the laser power, and we go as fast as we can, right? That helps our efficiencies. So after we able to do that, we, I re-ran the same identical program, and we have a part that looks like that, okay? And that's just a couple of weeks worth of work. Now it's the same material, but just a little bit of science. You can see how powerful this system is. It's absolutely wonderful. So after we do that, we can start making really nice walls, as you see on the right side here. Okay. But as they get taller, we start running into different issues. And so then we took a step back. We started looking at the programming aspect. So it's not as simple as programming one layer and then just doing a Z-level offset where we're running the same path over and over. So we've learned things about rotating layers, not using profile passes, moving the starting points. Um, and so we can take a part, such as shown there on the right side, same exact part. All we did is we rotated every other layer 180 degrees. It's as simple as that, the same part, completely level across the top, not a, bit, not a lot of excess wire coming out of the sides. And all this was was one simple coordinate rotation. Okay. Now at the time, there was no CAM software out there that could do this. But what we've done is we work with the CAM providers. And now every a lot of the CAM providers we work with, they now offer solutions like this. And not only does this work with hot wire, we see the same thing with power. So um, before I went to Oak Ridge, I worked at Georgia Tech. They had a BC500, it's a blown powder system. We saw the same exact issues down there. So what we're learning is not machine specific, this is technology specific. So we went out, not only did we work with Mazak, we look at the leaders in the camp. Um, so we ultimately we work with Autodesk, they make Paramel, that used a lot of you probably know it's Dell Cam back in the days. Um, they have some really nice additive capabilities. This is one of their most recent, they made an octopus and machine half of it, left the other half just stock material. We work with Hypermel from OpenMind, and then we also developed an in-house slicer. So when we started doing our polymer builds, there was nothing on the market out there that could do with what we wanted. So what we did is we hired a lot of program developers, and we actually have our own slicing software. And it's completely open source. You can Google search it. You can download it off the internet, and it actually has a working post for a Mazak hot wire. So moving into process monitoring. So now we have this machine. We have somewhat optimal parameters, but we want to keep pushing it. So we want to advance the machine, make it smarter. So the very first thing we did is I had a couple of interns working for me this summer. And so we just put some very simple sensors on the machine. Just a few hundred dollars, we can make a lot of improvements to the system. So um, simple as argon tank pressure. I can burn through a standard bottle of argon in four hours, okay? Now, it's no fun to go down every four hours and change the argon tank on a exact machine. Um, so what we do is we add tank pressure and someone gets an email. My technician gets an email and a text message every time we need to change an argon tank, right? Um, but now, of course, I have larger tanks. They got tired of changing tanks out. Um, then we look at spool wire remaining, okay? So I run this machine for hours on end, and if I have half spool of wire, a lot of times I have no idea if it's enough wire. And so for a while we were very wasteful on our wire. I have dozens of spools of half-used wire. Um, just because it's a lot better from a research aspect to start with a fresh pool than try to nip and tuck and if we run out we have to start over again. Um, so now we monitor it. And so we can start going back to our cam data, figuring out how much wire we actually need. 
how much we have left. Um, we're pulling off machine data. We're looking at the laser current to see what wattage it's actually outputting. So if I command four kilowatts, am I actually getting four kilowatts out of the laser? We look at the argon flow, the wire feed rate, and then at the very bottom, this cladding head thermal model. Okay. So the cladding head inside of the machine is completely enclosed. No sensors inside of it. It has a four kilowatt laser running through it, plus a kilowatt of hot wire power. All in this little tiny working space. So one day, we ran the machine for about five or six hours, and I get done, and since it's serial number one, I always kind of do my daily checks. I walk around, make sure everything looks okay. And one day, I opened up the front panel, and we found this nice melted cable in the front. So what had happened, this was not a Mazak error, not a machine error at all. What happened is, it was probably due to us poking around the machine. Um, what happened is the hot wire shorted through the frame. Okay, so I ran a kilowatt through a Mazak frame. And we melted the wire, um, probably had a little slight flame incident to it. And so of course the first thing is we're like, how do we stop this? And we took a step back and we said, well, we put a five cent thermocouple in it. We hook it up to an Arduino and you get a text message or an email every time it gets above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, we're monitoring that. If I go running out of here today, the machine at Oak Ridge is on fire. Okay. Um, so, um, I can show you pictures of pretty parts all day long. Uh, we've made some really spectacular parts, but we really want to get down and look at the insides of these parts. So, the very true thing we can do is add a camera to it. We put it in the spindle for $300, we look at the weld pool tension, um, or weld pool size, how it looks. So in this video here, what you're going to see is you're, this is what it looks like when we're starving the machine for wire. Now with this, I can make a perfectly good part, but on the inside it's going to be full of porosity, and you would have no idea unless you were actually looking at the weld pool. So as you can see right there, there's voids in that puddle. But our step over is so small, they fill inside, they leave small pores. And so that's why it's really important that we look at the world of those things. So, pictures are worth a thousand words, and a video is worth a thousand pictures. And then we're also looking at thermal monitoring, right? So, four kilowatt laser inside of a CNC machine. Traditional CNCs, they have coolant for a reason, right? They're supposed to be cool. You put a lot of heat inside of a system. We all know that metal expands, you start changing your overall size of your machine, you start losing precision. So what we're doing is we monitor the temperature of our parts. So what we do every now, what we do right now is between every layer, the machine pauses, and we just have a simple IR camera that's looking at the overall build temperature. And when it gets down to a specified temperature, we start the next layer. Right? It's just a specified temperature, and what that does is that drives consistency in our work. So we can take a part with overhangs that look like this. Now in additive manufacturing, overhangs are very difficult. It's hard for polymers to do it, and it's extremely hard to do it in metals. But just by monitoring the thermal process, we can take that part and turn it into something that looks like that, okay? Just by adding an IR camera and a little bit of perfume. So, taking a step further. So this is looking down the road. This is not introduced on the Mazak yet. But, so on the left side is um, taking a closer look at the path program. So if we wanted to make a part that looks like this, it's kind of this uh, honeycomb shape with varying sizes. So if you go to your traditional CAM software or a slicing software, what they're gonna do is, well they might do two things. They might start and do the outside of it. They're gonna do complete hexagons and then they'll do the infill. Or it's just gonna start on one side and work its way over, right? That's what we see a lot. So what we've done is we can actually optimize the system. So this is in our slicing software. What you're going to see is on the left side is a traditional slicing software, what it looks like. Um, you're going to watch it create the tool path, and all of the blue lines are retractions. So that's every time an extruder turns off, the machine backs out, moves over, and starts a new point. Then on the left or the right side, what you're going to see is the optimized tool path. And what you'll see is we can take a tool path that traditionally takes 33 minutes, we can turn it into 16 minutes, and we don't turn our extruder on. We don't have cold spots, we start fighting delamination because we can make an entire part at once. So as you can see on the left side, we go around the outside, it starts infilling, you see all of these retractions. 
but on the right side, we can actually make this entire part in one shot. So this is the sum of capability that we have built into our Oak Ridge slicer. And then this is by far my favorite slide. Um, on the right side, this is looking at the weld pool temperature. So there's going to be four videos that play at once. In the upper left-hand side, this is the position. So we're going to create a single layer, and that's what the shape's going to look like. It's going to go across, and it kind of looks like this heartbeat thing. Okay? So the machine's going to go. It's going to go to the right, to the left, back to the center, and move on. On the bottom left-hand side, that's just a standard video of the weld pool. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the flashing. This is actually on a MIG system. Or, no, this is a laser wire. This is a titanium system. And the upper right-hand side, there's going to be two plots. In blue, there's going to be the weld pool size, I believe. Yes. So what we're looking for is we want a constant weld pool size. We don't want it to get larger and smaller. Every time we turn around, we start fighting the machine accelerations, right? If you know if you run a CNC to one side and you tell it to turn right back around, you're going to stop for an instantaneous second. Now, it, when you're cutting, it's not that big of a deal. But when you have a 10 kilowatt laser, when the wire goes through it, you leave blobs. If that's bad, you create hot spots in the parts. And then in orange is actually the commanded current. So what we're doing is we're monitoring the size of the weld pool. And then every time we turn the robotic arm around, it's going to drop that laser power going to get a constant weld pool size. And then on the bottom right hand side is just a video of the IR. So it's what we're, the machine is actually seeing, what it's monitoring. So you're seeing it go along. Here's the weld pool. This is the temperature. You can see the wires coming in from this side, the hottest parts in the center. And so it's about ready to make that first turn. See the drop in laser power, and it goes back up. And the weld pool size is absolutely constant. We're not creating hot spots in the parts. And we're about ready to turn it around again. We see another drop in laser current. Okay. So that's pretty spectacular stuff. There's no one else that I know of that's doing this research. And this is publicly available, recently published. Now, at the MDF, we like doing crazy stuff. So not only do we want to make constant weld pool size, we took a step back and let's said, well, what if we want to make a shape out of it? So what we did is we created a wall, and we put the Oak Ridge National Lab logo inside. So as you can see down here, we start with an image. We put that into our slicing software. And then this is a real-life titanium part that's about 10 inches tall. And you can see the Oak Ridge National Lab logo. And that's not by changing the machine position, that's just by looking at the weld pool size. We have that much control over the system. Okay? So this is what we're looking at adding to the maze app. Now, it's phenomenal that we don't need it already. Okay? We didn't do this just for fun. We developed this stuff because we needed it. The system that was making these type of parts, it couldn't make parts like the maze app. Okay? That's what forces us down these roads of doing these developments. Um, so, and this also opens the door if you change materials, okay? So, instead of having settings for nine different knobs for each different material, you just make a smarter machine. It doesn't matter what your settings are, the machine's just going to set itself. So, going faster here. Uh, moving into some of the demonstrations. So, some stuff that we've done that's on the Mazak or with Mazak kind of show you what we've done in the past five months. So first, at ITS in 2016, we made five dives in six days. Okay. So we started at the very first day of ITS. We didn't do any pre-planning or anything. We just showed up at ITS and decided we were going to make five dives. So we did the design. We had a robotic cell to print. We worked with Mazak to machine them. And we made the dives at ITS. And one of them is actually from Whirlpool, and it's made um, probably well over 100,000 parts today. So this, these went out to industry. We didn't do this for fun. These are actual dyes in use. Uh, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, and then moving into the large scale demonstration. So when I got the Mazak hot wire, it ran for about a couple of hours at a time, maybe 30 minutes max. 
And so we decided to make a 100 pound part for all at once. And so we made it this part here. It weighs over 100 pounds with 24 inches and a primary axis length. It took 36 hours total, okay? This is without any control system on the machine. This is just out of the box, made of that hot wire. And this is absolutely phenomenal. This gives us all goosebumps down at the MPF. We have systems that have been there for years and they can't make parts like this without advanced control systems. And we just knocked it out of the park on the first shot. And the cool part about this is we had a failure. This part got so hot, the metal started just slumping off the side of it. So on a traditional manufacturing system, we have the MDF, they start over. And mind you, I had 20 hours sunk into this part. And all of the other admin guys, they came down, they laughed at me and said, well, looks like you're working this weekend. But I had a five axis CNC, so what I did, is you can take a, a one, in, one inch end mill, I went, cut off the bad part, created these stair steps, and then manually programmed layers to fix it, okay? So I took a part I had spent 20 hours on. It failed, because we didn't have the proper control systems yet, but we were able to save it. No grinding, no bandsaw, no starting over. We were able to save it. So this is kind of opening the door into these repair projects. Um, and then another project we're very proud of is working with USA Spares. Stuart Myers is here today. Uh, and so what, he's made these parts for years. They're hydraulic wear seals for the Navy. He's made them since the dawn of time, probably. They're 410 stainless steel substrates. They have stellite 6. It's a trade, stellite, it's a trade name. It's cobalt chromium alloy. And they just apply a very thin layer. Uh, now the traditional process is done manually. He has some gentlemen that I believe have probably made every single one of these in existence, and they worked very long days to make these parts. Um, I believe the first time yield on these parts is about 60%. The nice part about them is if you can't have a failure, you just cut off the top, you can redo it. So at the end of the day, they have 100% yield. Um, but it takes all day to make one part. Now with the Mazak hot wire, we can do the deposition in 40 minutes, and we can machine it in two and a half hours. Okay. And all I did is I pressed go and I sat and drank my coffee and watched it, okay? I wasn't sitting at a weld table for hours on end. Um, and then we have a good relationship with Zeiss. They're about 100 feet away from the machine with $6 million worth of metrology. So I was able to take this part right up to the machine, walk in there, they took a CT x-ray of the part. So what you're seeing in uh, black, we have the voids inside of the part. What you see in white is actually the tungsten carbide particles inside the material. This was one of our very first experiments. With stellite, we fight a lot of porosity. So that's why Stuart and Mazak are working with us and we're fighting this porosity. And I think we're very close to getting a solution uh, to automate this process. And then finally, as we're looking at the hybrid economics of hybrid manufacturing. So I can show you parts all day that look good, but until we can actually prove that they're just as good as the standard material, okay, that's when hybrids are really going to take off. So what we're looking at is we're, compare, we're comparing rock material versus a part that we build completely additively machined it, and then we're comparing that to a part hybridly made. So think about we print an inch, machine it, print another inch, machine it, print another inch, machine it. What we're doing is we're creating these very large hexagons. They're going to create about 50 to 60 dog bones. Um, now with the hybrid process, I can reduce the cycle time by about 85%. So I can save lots of time and money by using the hybrid process. But if I can't prove that I'm getting the same material properties, it's not going to sell, right? If you can't meet your spec, you can't sell parts. And I believe in a few years, we're going to trust the additive process more than we're going to trust the casting and the traditional forging. Because we're monitoring the process. I can tell you the microstructure. I can see pores in the system as they're being made. And with the hybrid system, if I see them, we can go in and fix them. We've done that. And then finally looking at component repair. So we're working with Delta Airlines to repair some of their high pressure turbine blades. Um, these are, that's an actual turbine blade that's flown on Delta Airlines for a number of years. The top's been cut off of it. Um, there's so much friction in the hot side, it wears the very top of the blade. And what we're looking at is putting it inside of a system, doing the cutting of the blade, adding the ML 718, I believe it is, and then doing the finished machining all in one setup. So this is a very new project. We're working with Delta Tech Ops in Atlanta, Zeiss, as well as Georgia Tech um, with their BC500 AM. So with that, I thank you.
I'm going to leave you with some pictures of how we further push the envelope, as Dan said. Because remember, if you're not pushing the envelope, it's just stationary. Thank you.